great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Alex Haddad. And interestingly, in 1999, when Murray was doing the Anglican lectureship, Alex Haddad was in fact the discussant. So it's a little bit, um, I think, appropriate that Alex should be here now as our final lecturer in the, in the lectureship series. Alex is a physician, an educator, a researcher, and a public advocate. His mission, according to his website, says is to improve health and wellness for everyone through the use of information and, and communication technologies. Alex was born in Colombia and educated there and came to um, us at McMaster by way of Oxford University in 1995. Um, he left us in 2000 for Toronto, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> um, he's held many, many um, important appointments um, in his, in his uh, lengthy career. He has a long list of accomplishments, um, awards, and recognitions. In short, Dr. Alex Sadat is famous, and we are so pleased that he can be here today. Um, probably one of his most important um, uh, aspects is that he is a lifelong friend of Murray and Eleanor. Um, and it is from that perspective that he will be presenting to us today his topic on birth, death, and how to enjoy the interval. So, Alex, please come and join us. <laughs> Well, um, close your eyes if you want. There's no place in this world where I'll belong when I'm gone And I won't know the right from the wrong when I'm gone And you won't find me singing on this song when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here and I won't feel the flowing of the time when I'm gone All the pleasures of love will not be mine when I'm gone My pen won't pour a lyric line when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here And I won't breathe the bracing air when I'm gone and I can't even worry about my cares when I'm gone Won't be asked to do my share when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here And I won't be running from the rain when I'm gone And I can't even suffer from the pain when I'm gone can say who's to praise and who's to blame when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here Won't see the golden of the sun when I'm gone And the evenings and the morning I think that song says it all And because um, words cannot capture but those who know and above all can feel this amazing couple um, could try to express. So <clears throat> I promised him that this would not be a hagiography. I said, don't worry. Really, you have received many tributes and many recognitions. So um, what I would like to propose today is a tribute to <laughs> that end. 
that end that inspired Phil Ox to compose and sing When I'm Gone, what inspired uh, them to act as a unity. And uh, so tonight, I, today, I would like to propose that we acknowledge the presence of, a, of the 10th muse. The ancient Greeks, at the very beginning, felt that there were three muses. Then over the centuries, the number increased to nine. And I think that today we have plenty of evidence. And I think Mary and Eleanor are the embodiment of what the muse of relationship can achieve, can enable us. And I think, because um, I've experienced that muse through them, is the spirit that enables us to think with each other, to feel with each other, to love with each other, and to live with each other. That muse is there in that end, in the preposition with. And I hope today to make a very strong case for the existence of this muse and for the acknowledgement of its presence in our lives. So, Murray and Eleanor, thank you for enabling us to experience that muse. And I know that most of us, all of us who know you, would agree with me. And uh, this muse um, is now singing through me. And um, made me feel that this period of time that we are sharing with you could have been entitled on love and contingency just as much. And uh, contingency has been a very important word in this whole journey. Because as they often say, everything is just a matter of perspective. Everything depends. There is no stable truth. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is that that muse was present there more than 70 years ago when Murray and a friend, and they loved each other very much, liked that beautiful woman at the same time. And they had to make a decision about how to handle that situation. They didn't want to ruin the relationship. The muse was already enabling them to value their friendship. And they decided to toss a coin. And Marie was the one chosen by the muse to approach this beautiful woman and start a relationship that now we are celebrating after so many decades. So here, I hope you can feel what the muse of relationship is enabling us to experience. Yeah. We connected in 1990. By that time, their book was already a big thing. And, uh, and I think this picture captures what the muse had already achieved uh, through these three hooligans. And, um, and very soon after we met, I heard from them <laughs> an expression uh, that has been attributed to many people. For me, every time I see it, is Murray and Eleanor and Mark and Murray and Ian. Um, which is another of the very important um, attributes of this muse, which is to inspire us to challenge. To challenge authority and to challenge ourselves constantly. And uh, 
the muse kept manifesting herself, himself, itself. It's unclear whether this muse has any gender. It seems irrelevant. But for those of us who have asked them, what's the secret? What's the secret? The muse manifests through them and then enables and forces Murray to say, it's all luck. But then Athena, the goddess of wisdom, comes through Eleanor and says, it's all about stick to itiveness. And then the muse of relationship says, thank you, Athena, sticking, okay? being persistent, enduring, surviving challenges is a very important thing. And then they would smile and say, no, Donna, really, neither of us has died. So, luck and stick to itiveness. We took this picture here. Um, now, over 20 years ago. And uh, it was, again, <laughs> an opportunity to experience the presence of the muse. And, and very soon, we became Maury and Alex. And uh, even though more than 40 years separate us, that we had been really focusing on, on aspects of life that seemed to be very, very separate from each other, uh, we realized that there was a very strong message underneath that we had to notice. And um, we noticed very quickly that birth and death are very similar. We're looking at the rituals. We're looking at um, the mystery. We're looking at the risk of medicalizing them. The passions, the emotions that are present at the very beginning of life and before a birth or at the end and even beyond death. So we were inspired by the muse to think of a new term that brought birth and death together. And we called it tocothanatology. It's the study of birth and death and the similarities between them. And we might need your support, those of, of you here present in person and those of you watching us at a different time in a different place. Because we are trying to make this term, coin this term and plant it into <laughs> Uh, the lexicon. But then we realized almost at the same time, this happened almost at the same time, that we found ourselves as patients and uh, becoming aware of our own fragility, of how ephemeral we are, of our own mortality. And then, again, it happened. We started to wonder, now what? What next? And we started to pay attention to something that we had ignored for decades. It was so obvious once we noticed it. And we needed help for this. Help came from George Santayana, Spanish-American philosopher, who deserves much more attention than, than he receives these days. And uh, we discovered Santayana and a dictum that is really buried in a book of the many that he wrote that pointed us to a very special place that gets overlooked most of the time. We're focusing on birth, we're focusing on death and their similarities. And what we were missing was the importance of the interval. Okay. 
So, what's next? Became clear to us. Let's enjoy the in-between. The interval. And this is my main mission today. Is to let the muse of relationship sing through me and invite us all and invite us all to pay attention to the interval, to the in-between. The time between now and our last breath. And our journey began, a magnificent journey that changed our lives forever and that today we hope would provide some tips for all of us to experience the true magical and mystical aspects of life. And the first thing, which was very hard for us to accept, was acceptance. To accept that we are truly ephemeral, that we are unimportant, that we really don't matter. As individuals, as families, as communities, or even as a species. No single species on earth has lived forever. The dinosaurs existed for much longer than us and went extinct. It may take five minutes, five hours, five days, five years, 50 years, 500 years, 5,000 years, or 5 million years, we humans as a species will disappear. And Kurt Vonnegut, I'm paraphrasing him, one of our favorite authors, once wrote, we are all writing with air on air. We are all writing with air on air. So we spend a lot of time fighting our egos. And I think the battle continues. But accepting our own insignificance was the first thing. Then the muse invited us to look at value. And somehow we were transported to our childhood to the time when we would be playing for beans, betting beans with our friends or with our siblings, okay? and fighting over these beans, and sometimes destroying relationships forever for these beans that in monetary terms would have almost no value. Okay? Unless we realize that each being contains life, is full of potential. So we decided to consider everything beings and allocate be value, a lot or a little, to almost everything that we found on our path. And, and very easily we started to recognize that most things that we value so much, when we just pause and spend time thinking about them, lack value, and that we can believe anything. If we can believe that this is valuable, we can believe anything. And yet we get very attached to the things that we choose to believe are valuable. And we also recognized, I'm talking about Alex and Murray and the Muse, that our minds can enable us to create entire new worlds, new experiences, which can be very, very, very sophisticated. 
And we're thinking about the movies. We say, okay, if we go now to a multiplex, for example, with money to buy a ticket, we will have a romantic comedy, a horror movie, a thriller, eh? a mystery movie, and then we choose. And then we buy the tickets and go in there. And then we sit. And then the lights go off. And then poof, images start to happen. And within five to 10 minutes, if it is a horror movie, we are terrified. If it is a thriller, we are full of intense emotions. If it is a comedy, we are laughing. And somehow, if the actors are good enough, we forget the names. We can recognize them, but somehow, we become immersed in the story and we actually live very intensely the story. So we said, what if we start thinking about life, our lives, as a movie in which we are characters? What would be worthwhile believing? What kind of plot would we choose? What kind of characters should we become? So we decided to choose a love story. With a lot of it. But what is love is the question. And we had to enlist a lot of people who were inspired by the muse. One of them, Thomas Aquinas, who said to love is to will good. It's impossible to love unless you wish good. But is that enough? The muse said, no, 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 no. That's not enough. It is essential to translate those wishes into action. It is essential to do good. But there is a catch here. We heard, we felt. And this has been embodied in what is known as the greatest commandment to Christians or the golden rule as variations of this in pretty much every culture. And um, this is the version that came stronger to us. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then a very important realization came to us. The fundamental requirement to love others is to love ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot love others unless we love ourselves. And this is very difficult because almost immediately we have the feeling that loving ourselves is a form of selfishness, of egoism. Because in most cultures we are taught to do good to others and to hopefully wait until everything takes care of our side. So thanks to Martha who kept insisting in the importance of, of loving ourselves. First, once on an airplane, the news came and made it clear. All this message that people read from a piece of paper are now come on a recording there, which is in the unlikely event of a decompression, hmm? oxygen masks will fall. Grab your mask. And what does it come after that? Put your own mask on first. Even if you're looking after somebody else. Even if you have a baby in your arms, you must put your own oxygen mask on first. And then you'll be able to be of 
maximum value to others. And then some feelings started to emerge, very, very, very uncomfortable feelings. And we were pointing in the direction of Anthony de Mello, who, after he died, uh, some students found little parables in his studio. And uh, one of them contained incredibly valuable insights, very short. It started, as most of these conversations with the master is the name of the collection, uh, with an interaction between a disciple and a master. And the question is, in this case, what's love? Yeah. And boom, the total absence of fear. What we learned from this is that the opposite of love is not hatred. And that feeling, that sense of being very unsettled was coming from our fear of loving ourselves first. And then the disciple cannot contain himself or herself and says, what is, what is it we fear most? Love, replied the master. So if fear is the opposite of love, if we are going to be genuine characters in a love story, we need to face our fears. What, what do you fear most? What do you fear most? There are five big ones. Fear of death, fear of failure, we don't stop to try to conceptualize what we mean by failure. We, just, we are just afraid of failing. Fear of being vulnerable financially, emotionally, or physically. We are afraid of ridicule, and we are afraid of disappointing other people who expect certain things from us. Those are the five, the five big ones. So the muse invited us, and this is an invitation from the muse. I can feel her, him, it. <coughs> invited, inviting us once again to answer this question. What would we do if we had no fear? It's not easy. And what we get is a picture of what love would be. Love for ourselves, and almost as the most beautiful side effect, love for others. So this crazy couple decided to face their fears and went to Antarctica <laughs> and had the most amazing trip of their lives. They had been all over the world. And as if that wasn't enough, they bought a big house in Victoria, a huge house with a big garden, with no help. When most people would be thinking about a retirement home where they would be looked after by other people and then fade away, they just decided to buy a big house and moved across the country and started a new chapter in their life fearlessly, loving more than ever before, themselves and others. But then it was my turn, almost simultaneously. What is my biggest fear? My biggest fear was to die. Fear of death. And I had worked in palliative care, in end-of-life care for, for decades. And I hadn't realized how afraid and terrified I was of death. And um, then decided to have as my goal to be dispensable, not to be needed. To be loved, but not to be needed. By my kids, by the students, I have the fortune to support. By the patients, I have the privilege to serve. By the team members with whom I work. 
and had to do it with, with help. This is another message. We cannot do this alone. So my 50th birthday approached, 9th of August, 2013, and my family gave me a wonderful surprise. <laughs> because it took us years, this process I'm describing in a few minutes. This required writing to people whom I had hurt, asking for forgiveness, the fascinating thing is that most of them didn't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> forgive me for this. Forgive, me, forgive you for what? I had been carrying all these rocks all my life, full of regret for having hurt people who didn't remember a thing about it. I thank people who hurt me. I, I thank people who supported me in much more positive ways. And I wanted to have a big funeral because they tend to go to funerals, lots of funerals. When you work in end-of-life care, that's part of it. You don't get used to them. But when you spend time with people from the time when they realize that they are mortal until they die, you notice a lot of things that are left unsaid by the time of the funeral. So you see the dead person there, and that person missed a lot of opportunities to say things to a lot of people. And then people start saying wonderful things about the dead person who they didn't get to hear when they were alive. So I said, I want to have a funeral, and a funeral in reverse, and a friend suggested the name an awake, which is to do it. <laughs> yeah. So my family tricked me, and I found this beautiful coffin the day of my birthday in my favorite spot, one of my favorite spots in the world in Cartagena, and I put my linen clothes and went inside the coffin. Fascinating to try to get into a coffin. You're usually put in there. It's not easy. The, <laughs> it, it feels really weak at the bottom. You feel as if you're going to go through. And then invited our kids to spend time with me and to imagine that I was dead. And each of the kids separately spent as much time as she wanted with me. Because if everything goes well, I should die before them. And they had complete privacy and complete freedom to say anything they want. And not to wait. And to give me the chance to listen was one of the most beautiful experiences. And then they closed the casket. <laughs> and the idea was that they would open it when I sent the signal. <laughs> <laughs> um, another very, very, very interesting experience to be in full darkness inside the casket. Words cannot describe how it feels. And then I gave a signal, and they played my funeral music, which now is the music of my alarm clock, by the way. <laughs> it's a good reminder every day. And they carried me. They carried me, and I could feel the, the waving of the, of the casket being carried. And... Uh, they took me to the living room and, uh, and opened it together. And uh, with a lot of help, and this had been very carefully curated, by the way, um, I made a commitment to myself. And the news was there in those hands, coming together. We were feeling with each other. Something incredibly deep, inspired by Nietzsche, who deserves more attention now than ever before. He was very sick, Nietzsche. 
Apparently, he had sex only once in his life and got syphilis. <laughs> and that may explain his madness at the end. And um, yeah, yeah. Poor Nietzsche. And <laughs> <laughs> but he was very sick uh, um, throughout his life with many other, many other ailments. And he couldn't write very long pieces. So as opposed to other philosophers who would get a question and spend their lives answering the, questions, the question and then write big books about the question, Nietzsche would write something relatively short and throw questions at us. At some point he said, God is dead. We killed him. OK, what are you going to do with your life if there is no God? Yeah. But in one of his essays, there is a piece which is called Eternal Recurrences. In this little essay, within the Gay Science, which is a bigger piece of, of writing, um, Nietzsche asks us a question. He says, and he sets it up like this. If you find a magical creature, they're called demons in German, apparently. The translation is very close to a demon, who has the power to enable you to relive your life an infinite number of times without changing a single thing and offered you that possibility to relive your life an infinite, infinite, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever number of times without changing anything. Would you say yes? And Nietzsche there says, most people would say, no, thank you very much. If I can change things, I would. But if I cannot change anything, no thank you. Hmm? OK, that's retrospectively. But what happens if we make a commitment to live whatever we have, the interval, the in-between, from now until our last breath, in such a way that if we give, if we are given that opportunity, we would say yes. So I ask for support from these people, my personal board of directors, chaired by Martha. And by the way, Murray and Eleanor are the Supreme Court. <laughs> When they cannot cope with me, they prescribe an anking fix. And it doesn't matter where they are. I have to communicate with them because I'm hurting myself. And they cannot protect me from myself. That's the main job of the personal board of directors. Yeah. So consider the creation of a personal board of directors. Who do you trust, really, to be your main allies? So you can conquer your fears and love yourself first, and then love the rest. So with their support came out with a commitment to divide whatever was left, that interval, into one hour chunks, and call them life units to, to be lived in such a way. That if they would be relived an infinite number of times without changing a thing. It would be wonderful. And this needs to happen with support. But then, willing good and doing good to yourself, to yourself and to others, is not enough. The most difficult challenge is to see good, especially when the circumstances are very nasty. Yeah. Nietzsche called it amor fati, to love it all, no matter what. How could we see good when there is so much evil going on in ourselves? And others. So I would like to share with you something that was captured by people who saw good 
And this is the muse. Feel the muse. Singing. The most of a moment, Adam finds out why a husband is wiping a bench for his wife on tonight's Sawatsky sign-off. Well. <laughs> this is about the moments that define a life. I'm just wiping the water off so she can sit down comfortably. Murray making the most of this small moment. <laughs> we like He's each nice. other. He's nice. He's been nice for almost 70 years to me. And you'll never forget the first moment he first met Eleanor. She was very beautiful. Was she? Yeah. Once upon a time. But... You have a twinkle in your eye. Well, <laughs> yeah, she's beautiful. That makes me laugh. She's laughed humbly at his every twinkle through 68 years of marriage. But there was nothing funny about the moment he was set to secure his first job as a family doctor. I was about to sign the contract, and uh, it, he just sort of looked up at me. Just We still had a pen in our hand. He says, you're not by any chance Jewish, huh, huh? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, I'm sorry. We don't want any Jewish professionals in the town. Although there was a moment when he was encouraged to fight it in court. All I said is, look, I don't want to get involved in legalities. Murray just wanted to support the health of a rural community, but life had other plans. Go where it takes you, and that, that, that's, that's been, <laughs> been one of our models. So they walked away from that town, and he became an internationally acclaimed obstetrician, which led to another moment. A midwife accused of negligence asked Murray to testify on her behalf. His first reaction, the same as the last invitation to join a legal battle. I looked at Ellen and I said, I don't want to get involved. She said, could you live with yourself if you didn't? I said, no, I couldn't. That moment with Eleanor eventually led to the legalization of midwifery in Canada, the creation of our country's first midwife school, and Murray being awarded the Order of Canada. She's the one who should have gotten it. <laughs> she should have gotten the Order of Canada. No. He credits the woman who raised his four children, who has never stopped inspiring a twinkle in his eye, who he will always wipe away rain for. I guess that's love. Thoughtfulness. <laughs> because, they say, if you go about your life thoughtfully, moments big and small can't help but be meaningful. Adam Sawatsky, CTV News, Victoria. Go where it takes you. Go where it takes you. And then the last piece. To love is to feel good. To feel the goodness. And um, now in Victoria, they continue to nurture intervals of everybody who comes close to them. They open this big, big table. They bring books. They discuss the books. They think with each other. They create the conditions to feel with each other. To love with each other and to live with each other. And I think we are blessed to have the embodiment of this magnificent couple. And we hope we continue to touch many more lives, inspiring us to answer the most important question of all. What kind of in-between would we like? Thank you very much. So I guess we have time for conversation. And um, here we are. <laughs> Let's use this time to, and I'm going to uh, see if this thing works. One, two, three. Okay. I'm going to destroy it too, just to follow your example. And uh, 
Thank you, thank you, Alex. This was fantastic and absolutely amazing. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, has Mary also tried the phenol experiment? The, which one? <laughs> the the <laughs> casket. No, no, because it's the, I, no, no, he hasn't, as far as I know. Um, each of us has a different set of issues. So for me, it was the fear of death. He's not afraid of death. In fact, he welcomes death. He has been much more comfortable uh, with death. And, and I hope they don't mind. By the way, we have had almost 30 years of constant contact. So picking these examples, these manifestations of the news of relationship for this occasion has been one of the most difficult things. But unless they threaten to hit me with their king, um, I'm going to start revealing some more things. So throughout our process, uh, and we were preparing for our death, by the way, um, it was clear that Eleanor was feeling very uncomfortable every time we mentioned the word death. She said, I know we are all going to die. Uh, I just don't want to hear the word death, OK? So you keep your conversation for the two of you. Martha is much more comfortable about it. But then as time went by, and by the way, this was a multi-year process. This, was, this didn't happen overnight or over a few weeks. Um, Eleanor would get closer because we would be reading about death, talking about death, thinking about death, writing about death. We started a diary on Google Document to document our uh, senescence, how our bodies were changing, how we were feeling things as part of this journey. And then Eleanor very gently would come closer and feel more and more comfortable with our conversations about, about that. And, um, and Maurice said one day, if something that I repeat very often, if I collapse here, please don't call 911. Please, OK? If I collapse now here, or if Maury collapses now, don't call 911. Do something nice to us. Don't kick us, OK? So, but do something nice to us. One day, they were walking downtown in downtown Toronto, and Maury collapsed. He was gone, unconscious. And the crowds came, and somebody was going to call 911, and this beautiful, magnificent woman was threatening them. Don't call 911! Don't call 911! <laughs> Don't you dare call 911! When Murray recovered, because he recovered fully, and in fact, he took the bus. They refused to go <laughs> home. And we talked about that and reflected upon that. We decided to go for ice cream and celebrate Eleanor's graduation. <laughs> so, and this was the crowning moment for us. Because we really were influencing each other and being dispensable was a key thing. At that point, we realized that Eleanor could conceive of a life without Murray, if you see what it would take would be to let him go without the risk of being in the middle of a medicalized environment in an intensive care unit full of tubes and all that. So, so even though we didn't, he didn't have the casket experience, we had something very close, it was much more real in that case. And, and, and that's how we, we managed it and, and perceived it. So, thank you so much. I'm so impressed, and I think the journey you've taken is so great. But uh, I have a general question why you talk about medicalizing the last moments? So in a sinister way. So why should it be? Okay. Um, because that's how it is. Uh, most people would like to die in a place they choose. Most often home. Most of us are dying in uh, institutions now. Um, we even, when we pass legislation, the physician assisted death. It's a physician assisted death. Okay? So even if you want to die, you need permission from people like me to allow you okay, to, 
to go through one of the most important decisions of your life. And twenty percent of people at the end of in the last month get with cancer get chemotherapy, about seventy percent blood tests in the last forty eight hours of life. Um, the costs of, of healthcare go like this. We consume forty to fifty percent of the resources we're going to consume in the in our lives in the last year. And uh, um, above all, I will share a personal experience with you. I was at a, an international meeting of palliative care. These are the people who devote their lives to the end. Okay? And I couldn't resist the question. I said, raise your hand if you're proud of what you do. 100%. Then the second question, the kicker came in. I said, raise your hand if you would like to die like your patients are dying now. 600 people from all over the world. Not a single hand went up. We have Ivan Illich, and this deserves to be read and reread and reread in medical nemesis, called it the expropriation of health until the last breath. We have taken over. So, and most of us uh, would like to, to die, and we have data now. We have an initiative called the Global Good Death Initiative. We are reviewing the literature, so we have plenty of, of research on what happens at the end. And we are very good at dying badly. <laughs> because death is the enemy. And we are the authority. Death is something to be conquered, to be fought against. This is a complimentary question. But like more than occasions of physician-assisted death, we have occasions of physician-assisted life. No, it's physician-assisted, uh, the obstruction of a good day. And, and I have had in, on many occasions throughout my life people saying the system is not letting me die. Okay? It's keeping me alive at all, and this is not life, by the way. Um, and, and I experienced it with my grandfather. My grandfather was an obstetrician, surgeon, a superhero. A man would jump from airplane to deliver babies in the middle of nowhere in Cesarean, he would put his medical bag at the time there were those things here, and a neighbor had a, a crop duster, and there was hand radio at the time. And there were doulas in, in different communities, and they would call grandpa and say, We cannot deal with this. Okay, he would call his neighbor and take a plane and jump on parachutes. <laughs> and he was the only surgeon, yes, the only obstetrician in a big area. And he was wonderful. And uh, at about my age, he started to develop arthritis. His fingers started to become stiff and had pain. And then he developed Parkinson's. And then he developed a stroke. And for years, I was part of the team that was looking for a cure. You see, something to cure my grandfather's problem. At some point, it was impossible to, to Keep going because he was uh, choking every time he was trying to eat, and a tracheostomy was prescribed. And he was wheeled into the operating theater of the institution he had founded with a big interest. And, uh, and uh, before entering the operating theater, he raised his hand, this big character, larger than life, his disciples around, loved one. He raises his hand, and this is the last thing that was heard uh, from him with his own normal voice. He said, if you reach 60 years of age and are not feeling well, shoot yourself. <laughs> we, in the name of love, have kept him going. We never asked him for him what he wanted. And I fell into the trap. I was here, the head of the evidence-based practice center at McMaster. I was the chief of the health information research unit, the co-director of the Canadian Cochrane Center at the time. And my impulse, and the impulse of everybody around me, was to do everything in our power to fix the problems that he was facing. We never asked him what he wanted. We disrespected him. He's one of my biggest regrets. It changed my life. And now what's happening? We are trying to cure death. There is an initiative called the 2045 Initiative. Google played a big role. Most of the biggest uh, organizations in the world, most of the billionaires who tend to be men, by the way, 
the eight richest people in the world are men, and they have more money than 3.6 billion people. And some of them are reaching the age when their prospects remind them of their mortality. <laughs> I can imagine a Warren Buffett going to the toilet and having trouble peeing, okay? <laughs> and, and your opinions don't help you. Yeah? Very nice. Um, so billions of dollars are going into uh, extending our lives forever. We are so afraid of failure. Okay? And the medical profession is a willing accomplice. Most of the research now, most of the biomedical research is, is, is devoted to uh, genomics uh, uh, or proteomics, all these omics, robotics, informatics, and nanotechnology. And if you scratch a little bit the surface, what you see is the emergence of immortality all over again with these new technologies trying to eliminate them. And we have become, most of us researchers, Accomplice and willing partner in that with a population that is very scared of failure. Fed by industry, fed by media, fed by, by pretty much everything. We are not spending enough time talking about the fact that at least this form is going to disappear sooner than we think, and that we need to be making the most of the moment here. Just two uh, comments. Uh, first of all, okay, hold on a second. Let me see. I think if not, I will do a. Yeah, it's on. But hello, hello. Yes. Okay. Not now. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to get closer. I have heard about it for decades. We just met two weeks. <laughs> You hear now? Yeah. Okay. Two comments. First, before such a wonderful talk, I expected it only from a friend of Mary. <laughs> Two comments. When you showed the slide with the man in a coffin, I leaned over to Murray and said, "You wait. He's going to get up out of the coffin and say, I love you." The other one, when you had four comments, is what do you do if you fear? What do you fear? You fear the absence of love. Those two comments. But a wonderful talk. It's so good to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we need teamwork here. So I am I, I missed the gym because of these presentations. Not yet. <laughs> um, wonderful to see you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank you so much for your talk. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. But I also want to acknowledge um, uh, and thank um, Murray and Eleanor for what they've done for midwifery care. Um, and also Karen and also Pat, because my career started in the neonatal intensive care unit 28 years ago. And um, Pat actually wrote me a reference for um, a degree that I took in bioethics at the University of Toronto um, to become a bioethicist. And so I've ended, I'm ending my career after a number of years as a bioethicist, and a lot of my work deals with end of life. So I started at the beginning and at the beginning of life, and now I do a lot of work around end of life. And the reason I mentioned Karen is because Karen was part of the midwifery group that delivered my two children. And so it seems to me like this is like like this talk was meant for me. <laughs> I don't want to be selfish, but um, everything that you touched on um, uh, resonates so much with the work I've done in in with newborns all the way up until the work I do with quality end of life at Hamilton Health Sciences um, and part of the university as well. Um, and I just want to acknowledge one thing that I think really um, touched me in your talk, and that is the things that we fear. And, and the idea of death and what death means to, to us as a society and in our culture and how we don't embrace death. And we fear death and we push death away and we want death to be distant from where we are. And we try and make meaning of life, but yet in the end when things become meaningless, we still want that. And so um, I appreciate 
the combination that you've brought today and i think all of us need to do work around recognizing how do we make meaning in between so thank you for that thank you and i'm going to use this as an opportunity and by the way this was for you thank you uh, <laughs> no no really really, really. The, the news i hope uh, 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 could go through as, as clearly as i was feeling her in it um because that was the intention the intention is to to ensure that we could communicate uh, through that so with murray we joined forces with richard smith a few years ago and um in typical Murray fashion and Richard Smith fashion, um, we published a paper for the Christmas issue of the British Medical Journal. And the title was Death Should Be Our Friend. Uh, on the Christmas issue on purpose. Okay? Um, and uh, over there, we, we bring the thoughts of, of a few philosophers who have consistent emphasize that perhaps what would give the greatest meaning to our lives is the, is the awareness of our mortality. Yeah? And Montaigne, for example, said that he was just building on, on, on work by Cicero, said to philosophize is to learn how to die. And to learn how to die is to learn how to live. So the biggest conclusion of our Global Good Death Initiative is that to have a good death, we need to have a good life until the last breath. Then the question is, what is a good life? And how could we become accomplices to enable each other to get away with it at a time of true abundance? This is a period of abundance. And somehow, you see, we are missing out on the biggest opportunity we have to eradicate hunger. In Canada alone, we are 35 million people. We waste $110 billion a year in food. The FAO estimates that we need 30 million a year to feed every person who is hungry in the world. 30. In Canada, 35 million people waste 110 billion. Enough food to feed half of humanity. Why? So we have an abundance of food. We still have an abundance of space. We have now new technologies that would allow us to build homes for everybody. Why do we have homes? There's plenty of materials, plenty of space. Hmm? So, in a cheerful and pessimistic way, because we decided to be cheerful pessimists <laughs> along the way, hmm? when we recognize that our lives are surrounded by the optimists, the difference between an optimist and a cheerful pessimist is that the optimists spend their lives trying to prove themselves right. The cheerful pessimists are happy trying to prove themselves wrong. <laughs> so our hypothesis, which is the non-hypothesis, is that we are screwed, there is nothing. We <laughs> <laughs> need to change things. But we are doing our best to prove that we are wrong. Enjoying the process. So, this is the time. This is the time to, to figure out if now to switch to, to palliative care, even if everything is um, beyond the line of no return, how about palliative care for humanity? And this is a paper that Maury and I wrote a few years ago that nobody has wanted to publish. We say, what would happen if we accepted that we as a species are dying and that we are accelerating our extinction? Just as it happens with individual patients when we do good palliative care, quality improves, and surprisingly, in many cases, the expected life length of the life left goes or becomes longer. So what happens if we apply what we are trying to achieve at the individual level to the species level? Then we need to focus on the sources of suffering, all of them avoided, hunger, homelessness, intolerance, gender-related violence, all the isms. But it's down to us to decide whether we do it or not. And that we can do if we decide to do it. Thank you for that. I'm still, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you now for two years. 
What's the cure? Got to have a cure for this. There is no cure. I know there's no cure. You had a funeral. I had a doctor tell me I'll be dead within six months. That was 2009. I'm still here, kind of. So I didn't know what I do. And I go to funeral a lot too. And I journey with people who are at the last stage. But I cannot still find myself not fearing that I have dreams of dying. <laughs> I worry about my son this weekend. He said to me, you're so old. You're going to die soon. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. Love you too. Yeah. So what is it? Uh, uh, disclaimer. Uh, love this man as a brother. Uh, I consider him the best companion I have found for people going through this process at the end of life. So, Marcus, thank you for the question. Um, there is no cure. There is care. There is mutual support. There is love. Um, it took us years. We had to meet this a serious issue. The most important issue to enjoy the interval was to, in our own way, because we had our own set of issues, we had to work together. We support from these two magnificent women in absentia during the first chunk and in full presence towards the end from element to conquer our own hesitation and, and, uh, and our, own, our own fear. And I still don't know if when I get a diagnosis of a terminal disease apart from life, which is a sexually transmitted terminal disease, uh, this, yeah? uh, when I face the active dying process, whether I would respond as I would like to respond. So um, I'm going to go now evidence based a bit, which I, uh, I avoided at all costs. We can talk about randomized trials and, and research evidence of the sort that we tend to overvalue. Um, there is now evidence showing that entheogen, that's a name for psychedelics, the most modern term, in low doses seem to eliminate the fear of death. So it might be possible to, to say the years that we spent, at least that I spent, dealing with, the, with my own fear of death. Yes, uh, psilocybin, mescaline, LSD, okay? These drugs that, despite the fact that they have no evidence of addiction, were banned okay? and considered class one drugs dangerous, okay? They seem, in low doses, to contribute to, to the elimination of the fear of death. So I'm very intrigued. And looking for partners, there are studies coming from Johns Hopkins and other places. There is a revival of this. So, so we might, in some cases, be able to benefit from something that could be aligned with the medicalization of life at the end. But apart from hard work now and making this a top priority for us, I cannot see any other. And it's hard work. This is not, this is not an easy job. And you're most welcome because we're going to continue working on that. Together. Yes. Hi, Dr. Jadad. Alex, Alex. Alex, I wanted to thank you for such a personal and introspective talk. And I also wanted to thank Marie and Eleanor for being absolutely the picture of a beautiful relationship and one that has withstood the test of time. So thank you both. My name is Vivian. I'm about to graduate from medical school here. And so in a lot of respects, I'm at the beginning of both my career and my life. I think for young people like me, it's, it can sometimes be hard to think beyond tomorrow and to think beyond, I heard someone's pager go off in the audience, the next call shift even. So I'm wondering what advice you might have for young people to think about the in-between and to think about the long term and how we might be more mindful of how we can live an introspective life in all of the days between. Maria Mellor may be in a much better position to answer. I will give you, I will give you a tiny, I don't give advice. I have, I have avoided advice and recommendations or suggestions, maybe just uh, notice, and Marcos taught me that. Notice what you must notice. And, and you're noticing that tension with thinking about tomorrow and the day after. You said it's very difficult. Don't. 
notice what's happening now. And notice that you're at risk of moment as a new physician. You're going to enter a world and you probably have seen 50% of, 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 of medical students are burnt out now. 75% of residents, most people at your stage would like to go into residence. The risk of burnout would be greater. The rate of suicide amongst physicians is greater, and especially amongst female physicians, by the way. So you'll be at risk of, of depression, deep depression, and, 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 and suicidal radiation. Um, that you belong to a generation that has been cheated by baby boomers like me. Um, we said to you, be good, study hard, uh, do what is expected to you, excel, and everything is going to be fine. You are now entering a world in which machines will be replacing most of what one or two generations of physicians did, but we have no idea of what our role in society is, where medicine is only perhaps good to deal with the acute and curable things. Uh, in a world in which most of the challenges we are facing are chronic and or natural, like childbirth or death, mm -hmm. that um, managers are dehumanizing our world, that you are going to find yourself as the victim of three forces, the financial sector that will go crazy, a corporate sector that is lunatic, obsessed with growth, and a government that is complicit to both of them, that you're going to feel alone. So, um, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you are, you are concerned. Don't face this alone. You are not alone. And we as civil society need to join forces now more than ever to see if together we increase our chances of a long, healthy, and happy life full of love until the last breath. Together.